good morning. Good morning. And welcome to everyone who is watching us today. Unfortunately, uh, with the weather as it is, we are now inside. We're doing a test run to get ready for next week. And uh, it's just obviously, uh, when you get into the fifth week, I, I had little, I had thoughts about it. When Linda Gundelsberger asked me to switch, I thought to myself, she must know that we're gonna have rain today <laughs> uh, because uh, intuition told me that uh, a fifth Sunday in the month, sometimes you just don't get that lucky. But welcome to all. We're happy to have you with us, worshiping with us. Welcome to friends, family, and all members of our congregation. Uh, let us open our service today with our call to worship. <coughs> holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Our Lord says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God is the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. We come to worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, let us continue our service by, in unison, together, offering our prayer of confession. God, God of grace, love, and community, we confess that we have failed to love you with our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us. Forgive our sin and raise us to new life, that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name. Hear us now and shower us with your grace. We give thanks to God, our gracious creator, our redeemer, and the giver of, our, of life. Uh, I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks, thanks be to, to God. God. Worship together, I invite you to join me as we read from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The Lord is powerful. The Lord is the Lord. The Lord is the Lord. 
Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives to his people. The Lord blesses his people. This morning, as we profess and affirm what we believe about our God, revealed to us in the Trinity, we want to state together our affirmation of faith. Please join me in one voice. We believe that adoption is an act of free grace of God in and for his only Son, Jesus Christ, whereby those that are justified are received into the number of God's children, have his name put upon them, the spirit of his Son given to them, and are under his fatherly care and favor, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of the children of God, made heirs of all promises, and fellow heirs with Christ in glory. Amen. Please lift your voice and sing with us. Thank you. As we turn to our reading from scripture, please join me in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, on this day, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to be in the presence of fellow believers and connected by the gift of technology. We thank you, Lord, as we look forward to reuniting in person and indoors for worship next week, that you are preparing us to discern our comfort level and our desire to reunite. Lord, in the coming weeks and months, as life begins to return to normal, as we turn to scripture for answers, as we seek your Holy Spirit's presence in our ministry, guide us, not only this day and always, to hear you speak. And now as we turn to scripture, guide us through the presence of your Holy Spirit to discern your voice, to reflect and meditate and, and understand better the call you've placed upon us. And Lord, let us live out our faith every day in amazing new ways as we encounter the unexpected as well as the expected. Thank you, Lord, for the call of discipleship you've placed upon our hearts, and guide us now. We ask this all in the name of Christ our risen Lord. Amen. So this morning, we're going to read from the book of Romans. And you hear these words in Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death those misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. And by it now we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are in fact God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs in Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now the book of 
Romans is written, obviously it's a title and it would lead us to think, to the Roman people, to people who are living under a empire, people who are worshiping Christ, but living in a world that is still, as we would see it, ruled by a dictator, ruled by someone who thinks he himself has some sort of supernatural dominion over the people. So usually when we speak about Christianity, we tend to frame ourselves in thinking about just living in the public life. Are you a Jew or a Gentile before you become a Christian? What's your background? Did you worship a multitude of gods or the one true God as revealed in what we refer to as the Old Testament? How did you come to faith? And the majority of those individuals who come to faith in a time right after the events that we spoke of last week, Pentecost, the events that are in the first generation of believers after Christ has left the earth, these individuals are still living in a world very different than ours. Many people today may use metaphors about dictatorship or how politicians are ruling our lives, but we don't really understand, especially as Americans, how restrictive life was when you live in an empire, when you live in a place where soldiers and the government are in charge of everything. So individuals in the Roman church, which not with a capital C like it is today, but Christians going to church in the Roman empire at this time were dealing not just with a faith change, not just with finally saying, I'm saved, I know Christ, this is a new identity as a disciple, but now I'm different than my family, my friends, my neighbors, people in the community, the people that I do business with. And the way that I'm living is so different than the way the structure and institution of life in my community is in an empire. So these words in Romans to the early church are about sharing. Now I can tell you for sure that the empire never talked about sharing, that the empire never told its people and its citizens and people under its dominion that they were gonna share with the common person. So to use language in your faith life that is so contradictory to the culture and institutional life around you can create a lot of friction. So a lot of what we read in the New Testament is highly instructional, is these discipleship lessons from Paul and other voices about how to be a Christian because it is just so different than the world that these Christians are living in. So if you were raised in a Jewish household with that heritage, you had an understanding at least of this connection to your ancestors, of being heirs, inheritors of a rich faith tradition. And Christianity continues with that language, especially here, of being an heir, a co-heir with Christ of all of God's promises to the future because of this connection you have, not necessarily due to biology, but through adoption into the family of God. But for believers who are labeled as Gentiles, as non-Jews who become Christians, there's not that same necessarily understanding of a network of belief, that you're somehow connected to your fellow worshipers. In fact, for some, religion was almost institutionalized into a way that it was forced upon you, so it certainly didn't feel like you were engaging in any sort of fellowship with other believers. It was almost like, we've got to do this together and please the gods or else all of us will have a negative consequence. So do this with me for mutual benefit, but not necessarily because I desire to engage in this faith. So to have these two kind of people groups come together and now engage in a religion that teaches them about sharing, community, cooperation, carrying one another's burdens, this is a complete lifestyle switch. We, living almost 2,000 years later in a Christian community and fellowship of believers as a church family, don't find it as odd because it's who we are. But for these first believers, this was a dramatic shift in just existence. Words that they started to use like community life, sharing, even this idea of communal living around the communion table, all of this was a new way of existing in fellowship, in community with your fellow believers. And it leads to this language, amazing language, language that we now use for family, brother, sister, inheritor, co-heir, these things that connect us, no matter how we were born or where we were born into what community and neighborhood or last name, that now connect us. But the gift of scripture is it's not just about sharing to everyone's benefit. It's not simply about sharing joys or sharing an abundance of food or sharing when we get together that we're gonna all lift our voices in song and be joyful to be in each other's presence. There's this acknowledgement that you're also sharing in the suffering that goes along with Christianity. And the reason there is suffering is because Christ suffered. 
Christ willingly suffered when he did not have to. Christ, who was without sin, without blame, not guilty of anything, was punished, tortured, and executed so that others would not have to be. When we pray the Lord's Prayer in the Presbyterian Church, we talk about debts and debtors. And some people, when they pray that prayer, talk about sins and sinners, trespasses, different language in that part of the prayer. But the language that historically the Presbyterian Church has used, and depending on what historian you read, there's a different reason as to why we use that vocabulary. But it echoes a vocabulary that's highlighted here in Romans. This idea of indebtedness, the fact that because Christ did something for us, in return, we reciprocal, we go back in that relationship, it's a give and take, and say, Christ, you did something for me, and therefore I must respond. And that's the indebtedness. It's not that you owe someone something in fear of a punishment, but you owe someone something because of a benefit. Christ already took upon this torture, this suffering, the pain of death, to give us this grace-filled gift. And so then we respond and say, thank you, God. I owe you. I feel indebted to you. I want to give back to you. And so we do that in a way that shows our great indebtedness. But it's not a burden of indebtedness. It's a joy. It's a sharing. It's a desire to be in community and relationship with God and with one another. So when we respond, and in that prayer, talk about debt and debtors, we realize that not only do we owe Christ an amazing affirmation of our salvation, an amazing thank you and gratitude, an amazing response, but we owe that to one another as well. For those gathered in this worship space, for those worshiping with us from home, we are connected in this amazing way that says we not only share in the joys, we not only share in getting together and enjoying fellowship, we not only share in the things that make us smile and laugh, but we also share in our sufferings. And part of that is the sharing of prayer, the visitation we do with one another when we're in need, the support and outreach that we show one another, and especially it's highlighted, and I know I talk about it a lot, but you've done it so well over this past year and a half, staying connected when we felt so disconnected. I brag on this church a lot, and my colleagues probably want me to stop because all I do is talk about how wonderful you are at this, but you have done an amazing job of staying connected with one another and really supporting one another. And when I call people for their birthday, or I call people because I know of a prayer concern, or I check in on someone, without fail, they tell me a list, a whole list of other church members who beat me to it, who already called, who already checked, who already dropped a meal off at someone's front door, who already did something before I got to them. And it's not because I'm necessarily slacking or falling behind, it's because you are so eager to reach out. <laughs> it's because there's this enthusiasm to share not only congratulations and happy birthday and happy anniversary and excitement, but also, I heard that you're healing. I heard you're hurting. I know you had a loss and I wanna be there for you. And that amazing sharing is what connects us. That's what true family connection looks like. So this language of adoption into the family of God, of being co-heirs, co-inheritors with Christ, it means you're a co-inheritor of everything. So we as disciples want to imitate Christ. And part of that is such a blessing. Because Christ did amazing things. Teach, heal, reach out to the brokenhearted, include those who felt excluded, sit and listen with those who were persecuted, labeled as somehow unwanted. We want to be those people. We want people to say, wow, that individual, because of their faith, is a wonderful friend, an ally, a colleague, someone I can really depend on. But in addition to sharing in those things that are celebrated, we're also invited to walk along with people in dark times and hard times, amongst pain and frustration, in things that are really beyond our control, and say, I can't fix this, but I'm here with you in it. And that's the holy sharing that is called upon every disciple. In this letter to the Roman church, it's a new way of being. Before this, those who maybe practiced the Jewish faith were kind of obligated to care for the Jewish community to keep their identity, to keep their heritage, to pass it on to the next generation, to carry that with them. It was like a badge of honor of how they identified. And sometimes that also partnered with faith, but not always. 
Sometimes it was more just about heritage and lineage and passing on to the next generation what we should in the way we do things. And for those who were Gentiles or non-Jews, who maybe worshipped a multitude of gods, the obligation was to please the God. Not to worry about the people around you, other than if more people around you also pleased the gods, it was good for everyone. So you weren't looking out for your neighbor, you were saying to your neighbor, you better do this too, or the God will be disappointed with us, and we may not have fertile crops, or we may not have bad weather, we might all get sick. So together we have to work to please the supernatural powers above us. So it was still kind of a selfish action of, to my benefit, you better work with me. Either to pass on our lineage, our heritage, our culture, our identity, or to make sure that there's no negative consequence. Work with me to everyone's advantage. And now there's this reframing in following Christ that says, no, it's not about just passing on the lineage, the last name, the inheritance, the property, the identity of your people. It's not simply about appeasing some sort of supernatural power that if it's not pleased with us, may punish us. No, it's about God. God in human form in Jesus Christ saying, I'm gonna come first. And I'm going to claim you as my family. I'm going to identify you as brothers and sisters to me. And then Christ says, in addition to that, Jesus is going to make a sacrifice, a physical sacrifice of himself, be tortured, endure the punishment that we all deserve as sinners, and thankfully, through the power of God, triumph over that punishment of death, and then offer with grace that reward to all people. So Christ takes the initiative, and Christ says, I'm going to do this first, and invites us to participate with him, to be co-heirs in this. And that response, that holy sharing, is what we're called to do. But this is amazing acknowledgement that it means sharing everything. And often, especially in the book of Acts, when we read about the early church sharing, we get caught up on the material sharing. They shared money. They shared housing, they shared goods and services. They brought everything together, kind of pooled their resources. And that's a part of it. And the church still does that. We still, as good stewards, still give up our financial gifts. We still give up objects. We still give up our time to do tangible tasks. But in addition to that, there's this amazing invitation in discipleship to sharing our lives with one another, to genuinely knowing one another, to being in relationship with one another, to no matter how physically separated we may be, to still remain connected. And as people visit with our congregation, as I talk to people who worshiped here in the past and then moved away and still have social connections with the church, the narrative everyone brings up is about that amazing family sense for this congregation. It's not unique to our church. Many churches have that family sense. But that's the language and the living into that we're called to in scripture. That the church is not just an institution or a service or a place to do certain tasks and then leave and go live your life. But through your church family, your entire life is changed and transformed and you live it out differently because of that. So this amazing call to share, not only in the benefits and abundance and blessings of the church, but also to acknowledge in our church family that when part of it is hurting, we share in that healing process. We share in that process of mourning we share in that kind of holy anger and frustration that we feel sometimes when things aren't going the way we want them to. And in doing that, it creates what genuinely is a family. And we acknowledge, as scripture does, that that's in the family of adoption. It's not necessarily our biological family. And it's a family that many of us have chose. Those who've come to this church and said, this is where I want to live out my faith with these particular people in this place, in this time, and over our life, we may move and have different things change and end up associating with a different congregation and then find another church family, a way to connect in that way. So as this congregation continues to live out that faith, as we prepare to reunite in person indoors next week, as we prepare to kind of get back into what was the normal pattern of the life of this church, thankfully, with all the disruption we've experienced over, over a year of time, the consistent thing that hasn't changed is this amazing ability to share, to be connected, to still be the family of God. And we have shared in a lot of suffering over this past year. 
you also have shared in an amazing amount of abundance and grace and joy. When we come back together, that will continue to be true. So I encourage you in the weeks ahead to be aware of that sharing, to give thanks for it, and to name it. Don't be afraid to say to people, I'm calling you because of my faith. I'm reaching out to you because I know you in our church family. The reason I love you, the reason that we are connected is because of our faith. And in addition to that, I genuinely like you. I want to be with you. You're my friend. But I give thanks for the fact that our connection is born out of our mutual identity as being part of the family of God, disciples of Christ, connected by the Holy Spirit. And that's the foundation upon which we built our relationship. And we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that that's where we start. And then on from that place, we share in so much and are comfortable in doing so because of that amazing holy connection that we have. So I encourage you to follow the example and teaching of the early church to continue to be connected and to be sharing and to continue to acknowledge the amazing ways that this unique family, this diverse family, this family of different ages and backgrounds has come together in this time and place with the mission of this church to say, we're going to serve alongside one another. We're going to do ministry. We're going to overcome any hurdles in front of us. And because of that, ups and downs and everything in between, we're going to know how much we are loved by our God and connected and included and can identify ourselves and say, truly, it's a joy as well as a burden sometimes to share in ministry. But I'm so thankful we're doing it together. Amen. for your continued amazing stewardship, for your continued response to the needs and the ministry of our congregation. As you may be aware, this week the steeple is under repair, and so we've had many workmen on the front lawn up on sort of power lifts doing quite dramatic construction. And thankfully, part of that project's being paid for by an insurance claim, but the rest is because of your generous stu good stewardship to our congregation. And hopefully, when that project is complete and the neighborhood sees again our steeple clean and new and sturdy, <laughs> they will understand that there's a future in ministry here and a hope-filled congregation here that is making plans to continue to minister in our community into the future. I also want to thank you for your amazing stewardship this whole month. There is a ginormous piling of clothing donations that will be given to the Whosoever Gospel Mission in a day or two will be picked up and benefit their thrift store as they just begin on June 1st to reopen that ministry. So we will be the first kind of delivery of donations as the Whosoever Gospel Mission reopens and recalibrates into this new world what that looks like as they accept donations for their thrift store and open that ministry back up to the community in a full way. So thank you for that continued stewardship. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for the amazing generosity of this congregation, for the way we feel an abundance and overflowing of blessing, and the way we respond. Thank you, Lord, for those who are able to respond financially. We also thank you, Lord, for those who bring tangible gifts, who bring time, imagination, energy, their presence among us, their service to the church. We thank you for the way you've called us, each in different ways, to be gifted and equipped to provide for all the needs of this ministry. We thank you, Lord, for the support our congregation provides locally and around the world, and we ask for your continued blessing upon each one of us to be eager and joy-filled givers, as well as to show gratitude when we receive gifts from others. We lift those all up in the name of Christ. Amen. church family. I want to share with you the wonderful joy that Elaine Portell and I had on Friday to finally see Marge and Jerry Diebold in person 
after many weeks of having restrictions on visitation, we were able to get in and spend an hour with them on Friday, and they are filled with joy and so happy to be connected to our congregation. They thank you for all the outreach, the cards, the phone calls. In fact, Marge gets so many phone calls, many of us get a busy signal and have to call her back. So thank you for that outreach. Uh, they continue to both be doing well and improving on their health, and hopefully this summer we'll be making some decisions as to what their living situation looks like into the future. So thank you for that continued outreach. We'll keep you updated on when the visitation policies may allow for more of us, hopefully outdoors, to gather with them over at the Philadelphia Protestant home. Those in the room here, do we have any other additional prayer requests this morning? There, there are, I see, one, two, three, four, five, six. there's seven of us in the sanctuary, so I give praise to God that seven of us were able to gather this morning, and hopefully next week when we do return to indoor worship, there'll be even more of us together. Please join me in prayer. Creator God, on this Memorial Day weekend, we acknowledge and lift up to you all those who are mourning the loss of those who have served in the armed services. We thank you for their amazing sacrifice. We also lift up to those who are currently deployed and those who are in active service and ask for their safety and their continued hard work in preserving freedom and a quality of life that shows respect to all people. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of this congregation. We thank you for the ways you've been able to stay in touch with one another. We thank you, Lord, as we look ahead, the calendar is filling up with activities and programs and opportunities for service and fellowship, worship and study. Lord, as we look ahead to returning to in-person indoor worship next Sunday, guide us to discern ways to keep everyone healthy and comfortable. Allow us to reunite in ways that show respect to God and neighbor, and Lord, we thank you that in this time apart, our congregation has supported the ministry of this congregation in amazing ways, including the refurbishment of this worship space. When we return into it, everyone will see how beautifully painted and cleaned and restored it is, a place to truly honor you, Lord, and to honor one another as we come together to praise you. Lord, we lift up to you all those in our congregation who continue to deal with health struggles, asking for their healing and comfort and wisdom for their caregivers. Lord, we lift up to you those who are continuing to struggle with the adjustments of life, with going back to the office, with changes at school, with the summer on the horizon. And Lord, we know that brings with it all sorts of unknowns and anxieties, and we ask for your calming, reassuring presence. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you to be connected, to acknowledge the indebtedness we have for the grace-filled gift of salvation. And Lord, we ask that you continue to guide us to share in our joys and burdens, to be connected, and to honor you in all that we do as a church family. We ask this all as disciples whom you have asked to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us lift our voices in praise of God.
sunny days and brighter weather, we also look forward to the ability to reunite, to continue to share in ministry together, to continue to support one another, and to be aware of the way the Spirit has equipped us in this amazing partnership, this balance, this unique diversity that brings all of us together, equipped not only to serve God, but to love one another, to carry each other's burdens, and also to celebrate with one another the joys of everyday life. We go out from this place eager to continue that amazing connection as co-heirs to the gift of eternal life and as brothers and sisters in the family of God. Go now with the blessings of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Messiah, and the knowledge of the ever-present, ever-comforting Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.